Hi, my name is Jay Sugarman, and I want to welcome you to Museum Open House. This ongoing series features and highlights many of the outstanding museums and other cultural institutions. The main purpose of most programs is to inform viewers about programs, events, exhibitions, and other information that is available for the general public. Today via Zoom, we're fortunate to have as our guest, Zach Jensen. Zach serves as the education specialist at the Mob Museum, which is located in Las Vegas. Officially known as the National Museum of Organized Crime and Law, the Mob Museum is dedicated to featuring the artifacts, stories, and history of organized crime in the United States, as well as the actions and initiatives by law enforcement to prevent such crimes. During the program, we'll learn about the history and mission of the Mob Museum. We'll go on a behind the scenes tour and in the process come to better understand and appreciate the wide range of exhibits, programs, events, and other opportunities that are available for visitors today. Let's start by meeting Zach and then hearing all about the Mob Museum. Welcome Zach, so delighted you're able to be here. Hi there. You know, for the past couple of years, I kept seeing the Mob Museum come up on recommended outstanding museum lists. So eager to hear much more about it and have you inform viewers. But before we jump right to that, I think it would be of interest just to hear a little bit more about your background, professional interest, and what your role entails at the museum, please. Yeah. So, uh, my history, I was born and raised in a suburb of Washington, D.C., the D.C. metropolitan area. And, you know, I'm sure you know a little thing about Washington, D.C. It has a couple museums there. So <laughs> growing up, I went to Smithsonian museums all the time, mm -hmm. whether, you know, it's my parents taking me or going there on a school trip. You know, I, from a young age, got a love of museums mm -hmm. and also was introduced to history. My dad is an amateur historian. And so, you know, I was inundated by history, you know, growing up. And so that carried over into adulthood. Uh, when I went to college, one of my first jobs was working in a small natural history museum. And, you know, I already had a love for museums, but that gave me a love for working in museums. Mm. So I decided that's what my career is going to be. But I had in mind a natural history or a science museum. So that's kind of where I aimed my direction. Mm -hmm. I was, you know, I got my degrees uh, in geology and paleontology. Mm. Uh, so out of grad school, I was looking for the next museum job. Well, I found a really interesting opportunity at the Mob Museum as a museum yeah. educator. And, you know, this is such a unique opportunity. I can't pass it up. And at the time, my thinking was, you know, I'll do this until I can find that coveted natural history <laughs> job. But what happened is I ended up falling in love with the subject matter. I, you know, became enthralled by history all over again and, you know, decided that this is my career path, you know, not as a paleontologist for a natural history museum, but for as a historian for the Mob Museum. Mm -hmm. Well, you seem like a perfect match. And I know we'll be hearing much more later about the exhibits and programs that you and your colleagues have developed over the years. But before we jump right to that, I think it would be of interest for those of us who aren't as familiar with a little bit about the history of the museum, why and how it came about. Yeah, so the history actually goes all the way back to 1933 when the building that houses the Mob Museum was built. It was the old U.S. Post Office and Courthouse. And so that had federal court all up until we made a new building, uh, created a new federal building. So, you know, fast forward to, you know, our mayor, then Oscar Goodman. He's at City Hall, which is right next door to the federal building. He's looking out his window and sees, you know, there's not much happening with that building. We need <laughs> to do something about it. So he made a deal with the federal government that the city of Las Vegas was going to purchase the building for $1. But there was a string attached that we had to use it for a cultural purpose. Mm. And so Oscar's idea was to have a museum about organized crime, a mob museum. 
Now, as you can imagine, there was some resistant in, <laughs> resistance in the community to that uh, because, you know, some people feared that this would be a place that would glorify organized crime, that would glamorize it. Others feared that this would be a shrine to Oscar Goodman, who was a former mob attorney before he was mayor of our city. And so to, you know, dismiss those fears, uh, he brought in another person. Uh, this person, really important person in Las Vegas, Ellen Knowlton. Uh, she was the former special agent in charge of the Las Vegas FBI field office. Mm. And she became the first chairperson of our board of directors. So, you know, having Oscar and Ellen at the helm, you know, that really, you know, assuages those fears that this was going to be a museum that glamorized organized crime, but no, it's going to be a balanced story of both. Wonderful, wonderful. What were some of the major changes and developments since that start? So, you know, our mission is to advance the public's understanding of organized crime history and its impact on American society. You know, we opened on February 14th, 2012. Uh, we picked that day because Valentine's Day is a significant day in mob history, which we'll get into later. But, you know, we are not a static museum. You know, since 2012, since we opened, we, you know, want to continue to advance the public's understanding by refreshing our exhibits continually and adding, you know, more to our exhibits. You know, as I said, we're in a federal building that was built in 1933. It's not a huge building. So we try to make sure that every square inch of the Mob Museum is dedicated to educating the public. So over the years, we've made additions to the exhibits. You know, we've expanded whole floors uh, mm -hmm. to include new exhibits and new experiences for our guests. Terrific, terrific. Before we jump into each floor individually and just hear some of the exhibits and highlights, a quick overview of what the three floors consist of. Yeah, so the way we've arranged our museum is chronological. Uh, we start our guests on the top floor, the third floor, and from there they work their way down through the history of organized crime in America. So we start at the top with the beginning of organized crime, and then we go through, you know, their heyday in America, that where they were at their peak of their power, and then we talk about how law enforcement got the tools to ultimately combat the mob, and you know take them down or make at least make them much smaller than they were in their yeah. heyday. heyday. Mm -hmm. And then we conclude with a tour of prohibition in our basement with our speakeasy and distillery. Fabulous, fabulous. Well, let's take a little closer look and we'll start, um, as you said, the beginning on the third floor and get a, a nice overview of what's available for visitors today. So we start at the beginning, which is the massive waves of immigration that the United States was experiencing in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. You know, a lot of these immigrants were Irish, Italian, and Eastern European Jewish. And, you know, they were coming to America hoping for opportunity. And that's where we see organized crime really take off in America. You know, it's a small percentage of these immigrants that decided to take that shortcut into organized crime to, you know, make money. But uh, that's really where we start to see it get organized. And, you know, what really makes organized crime take off, they have been steadily building since then. But prohibition really turns them into a nationwide syndicate. Mm. And, you know, we do take a slight detour into talking about the history of Las Vegas, because that's also happening around the same time Las Vegas started in 1905. And, you know, a lot of people who come to our museum, they have this notion that it's the mob that started Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. But that's not true at all. You know, Las Vegas was not started by the mob. It was around for decades before the mob got here. And so we want to, you know, make sure we tell that story, you know, so it's in the same time period. So it's fresh in guests' mind as they learn about the mob in Las Vegas. Terrific, terrific. And uh, some of the real highlights of the museum are found here. Yeah, so we have in our in our space dedicated to prohibition, we have our prized artifact, and this is the St. Valentine's Day Massacre Wall. Mm -hmm. So those bricks you see there, 
uh, seven men were gunned down in front of those bricks uh, in Prohibition era Chicago. And these men were uh, part of a rival gang of Al Capone. So we are able to tell you know, mm. a lot of stories about organized crime through this you know, really important artifact. You know, it's so important that that's the day we open the museum on Valentine's Day. Also, we have all of the evidence, nearly almost all of the evidence from the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. Wow. The only, the only part, evidence that we don't have are the two Tommy guns that were used because those are still with the Michigan Police Department that originally confiscated them. Wow. But they do bring them to the museum once a year on our anniversary. Uh -huh. uh, so, you know, we're very proud to have it. You know, everything is either on display or in our collections. And, you know, from there, we tell the other side of the coin with law enforcement. You know, around the same time that the mob is getting powerful during Prohibition, law enforcement is also developing. You know, organizations like the Bureau of Narcotics and the FBI, they're being born in this same time period. You know, so, you know, just as Al Capone is taking off, so is organized crime getting the tools to take down Al Capone. And there is that wonderful display where we see the little highlight there, the tax dodgers, mm -hmm. um, which uh, was one of the ways um, some people got apprehended. Yeah, you know, it's not until 1970 that the federal government can charge somebody as being part of organized crime. So before then, we have to go about it a different way. And tax evasion is a big one. But do you think mobsters pay their taxes? No. And the Supreme Court says in 1927 that they, yes, they do have to pay their taxes. Great. Well, let's move on. Uh, one final area on the third floor. Yeah. So, you know, from the end of the prohibition, you know, the mob had amassed so much power and influence that they didn't even need to sell alcohol anymore. They could move into other things and strengthen their existing rackets, you know, mm. things like illegal gambling, sports fixing, and drug trafficking, you know, those become, you know, the mob's bread and butter. And so that's where we are get, get to tell that story. Plus how organized crime, you know, became a nationwide syndicate. They didn't, weren't born as that. They grew into that over the over time. Let's make our way down to the second floor and see what we can enjoy. So most of our second floor is dedicated to the story of Las Vegas. We are a museum in Las Vegas, Nevada. So we do want to tell that story too. And we start with the Kefauver hearings. So these were the first Senate investigation into organized crime in 1950 and 1951. And these hearings are really important to the mob museum because on November 15th, 1950, one of those hearings was held in Las Vegas in our building. Mm -hmm. So we've restored the courtroom to its 1950 look. Uh, so people can really get immersed in that history oh, wow. and you know, know what it was like to sit in that gallery when a mobster was up front testifying. And from there, we continue the Las Vegas story. We talk about how uh, the mob got involved in Las Vegas and some of the early casinos. Now, they didn't start casinos in Las Vegas. They didn't even start the Strip, but they did bring a level of luxury that wasn't seen in Las Vegas mm -hmm. casinos before. Uh, so, you know, Las Vegas is an open city. Any mob group can come in and open a casino without worrying about turf. So that's why we see a lot of different mob families represented here mm. from across the country. And so we talk about what casinos they were involved with and how they made their money, which is through skimming. And a lot of it, a lot of it form of another mob classic tax evasion. Mm -hmm. mm. And a, f a few mo other areas on the second floor. Yeah, you know, one of the biggest questions I get frequently from our guests is, is the mob still here in Las Vegas? And the answer to that is, that is no. Las Vegas eventually went straight starting in the 60s and lasting through the 80s and 90s. And so the mob isn't here anymore. And we want to tell how, you know, it's really the corporization of Las Vegas that spells the end of the mob. Plus, you know, law enforcement, you know, amping up its game and having more tools to go after organized crime. Mm -hmm. So we conclude the Las Vegas story there and get back into the national story. So we talk about, you know, how the mob was involved with, you know, corrupt government officials and, you know, are at the heart of a lot of 
mob conspiracy theories, you know, including, you know, something that actually happened. The CIA contacted some mobsters to try and kill Fidel Castro. So that's highlighted yeah. in that room, too. Mm -hmm. And then we get into a more somber experience with the mob's greatest hits. So this is a room where we have crime scene photos uh, of when, you know, famous mobsters were killed. Because we want to, you know, drill that point. If you chose that way of life, chances are you might face a violent end. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we don't just highlight the mobsters in that room because uh, there's also many innocent people that were killed by the mob. You know, one of the sayings, famous sayings by Bugsy Siegel, famous Las Vegas mob mobster, yeah. is that we only kill each other. But that's not true. <laughs> many innocent people get caught in the crossfire and we want to tell their stories, too. For sure, for sure. And then getting closer to present day, um, first floor. So the theme of this floor is mob on the run. So this is really how law enforcement got the tools to take down organized crime. So with that's with the 1970 RICO Act, which I alluded to before. Now the federal government can charge a mob boss for giving an order to commit a crime, especially if that crime crosses state lines. And then they also have things like, you know, improved wiretapping methods, undercover agents. And from there, you know, the mob really starts dropping like flies. These bosses, you know, find it hard to stay in power. Um, we also highlight some of the, uh, you know, made men over the last hundred years. And, you know, by made men, I mean anybody involved in organized crime, not just the mafia, but also, you know, people involved in cartels like Pablo Escobar and Grisel mm. Durango. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's a really good segue into organized crime today. We want to tell the story of what it looks like now, because now it's a global enterprise. It's not just, you know, about the Amer United States anymore. It's in every country in the world we see organized crime. Unfortunately, true. Yeah. And this is another nice opportunity for interactive experiences. Yeah, this is something that we're really proud of. Uh, so we have a few interactive experiences, really immersive experiences. So we have our crime lab, all about forensic science. Our guests can go in there and really learn what forensic scientists do to solve crimes. We also have our use of force exhibit and our firearms training simulator. So what that does is it puts our guests into the shoes of police officers, and they get a taste of the same kind of training that police officers get when they're learning to, you know, do their duties and, you know, how to use their firearms. Terrific. And in the basement, the underground, several uh, fabulous opportunities. Yeah, so the underground is an immersive prohibition history exhibit. So, you know, we want people to feel like they're traveling back in time to the 1920s and experiencing prohibition not just on the mob side, we talk about that upstairs, but we want to tell people what ordinary people were experiencing during Prohibition. So, you know, the exhibit spaces feature a lot of artifacts, a lot of information about, you know, what people were doing, how they were getting their alcohol, plus, you know, the pop culture of the time. You know, we highlight people like Josephine Baker and Anna Mae Wong, Harlem mm. Renaissance, because that's an important thing in this period of time, too. But it's more than an exhibit because. <laughs> To really get the experience, you got to drink like people in the 1920s. So go. we have a lot of 1920s uh, inspired cocktails uh, from the era that guests can experience. Um, and, you know, one of my favorite things, if you look at that bar, there's exhibits in the bar. Mm, I love it. Fabulous. Now, right next door to our speakeasy is our distillery. So we make our own award-winning moonshine mm. at the Museum. Wow. So our guests can get a tour of the distillery. They can also taste our moonshine. Uh, and a lot of people are pleasantly surprised by uh, how smooth it goes down. I was too. <laughs> terrific, terrific. Well, this is outstanding. But in addition to just the exhibits, I have to say, I was incredibly impressed with the programs and events that we're going to hear about in the remainder of the program that you and your colleagues have put together and continue to develop both for education purposes and other audiences. Would you please share these wonderful uh, opportunities? Yeah, so one of our core values, core values as, a, as the museum is our commitment to the community. 
and not just the Las Vegas community, but you know our nationwide community. So we want to make programming available for those who live near us and those out of state too. Uh, so we hold a number of public programs and events. You know, we have you know guest speakers and panels featuring authors, you know, law enforcement officers, even reformed mobsters uh, talk at our programs. And there's actually one program I want to mention, which is Family Secrets with Frank Calabrese Jr. Mm. So this is a regular program we offer uh, five days a week at the Mob Museum with reformed Chicago outfit mobster Frank Calabrese Jr. He, wow. tells our, our, he tells his story to our guests at the top of every hour from 11 to 5, Wednesday through Sunday. Wow. It's a, it's a really fascinating story. He's a very engaging speaker, also a really nice guy. And, you know, even if you're not at the Mob Museum, you can still hear his his story on our website and our on our YouTube page. Every program that we do goes on our YouTube page, mm. so you can hear all those fascinating stories. You know, our building's not big, so we don't have have the space to tell every story that we want to tell. So we get that chance through our public programming. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Some of the outreach programs, I know with education in mind, first, would you share just number of opportunities for students, both locally and beyond? Yeah, the, the, our outreach program is something that's near and dear to my heart, because I've held a number of positions at the Mob Museum, and one of those was coordinating the outreach program. Uh, so there's really two prongs of our outreach program. The first is investigating history. That is a school outreach program. So we visit schools across the Las Vegas Valley and beyond. And we actually bring historical objects into the classroom so students can get a real hands-on history and learn, you know, older students can learn about the mob, but don't worry, we're not going into elementary schools and talking about organized crime. We're teaching them about Las Vegas history and things like forensic science. But, you know, with the older students, middle school and high school, then we can get into organized crime. And it, it's a really fun conversation to have with the students. I have personally got, gotten to do a lot of that. And then the other half of our outreach program is our adult education program. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of it is directed through to senior communities in Las Vegas. And, you know, this is a conversational lecture program. We also bring objects into uh, the places where they live, places where they play. And, uh, you know, it's just a fascinating experience getting to, you know, talk with, you know, senior adults, even those who have lived in Las Vegas a long time. You know, I do have to share, you know, we have a program about Las Vegas entertainers where we play, you know, clips and videos of some of the musicians here in Vegas. And it always brings a smile on my face when I see, you know, you know, our seniors really come alive when they hear that music. <laughs> you know, really reminds them of growing up. And, you know, it's just such a wonderful experience. That's fabulous, fabulous. And I know um, for educators, the resources, the curriculum opportunities that I know, especially locally, are tied to state standards. Um, so wonderful way to dovetail incredible experiences with the requirements uh, back in the classroom. Yeah, you know, we want to make sure that, uh, you know, our educational outreach programs, they're great for the students, but we also want them to be useful to the teachers too. So they, we do align them with state curriculum. So the teachers you know, are getting something out of it for their classroom too. Nice, nice. What's been some of the reaction and feedback that you hear or observe from the range of visitors that come to the museum? You know, we are very fortunate to have wonderful feedback from our visitors. You know, one of the things that we hear a lot is people say that you know, they originally planned to just come for an hour. But what ends up happening is they're, you know, hours later, they're still here. And, you know, that was also my experience when I first visited the Mob Museum. And, you know, I, I've had a lot of conversations with guests about their experience at the Mob Museum. And a lot of people are surprised by our storytelling because, you know, they assume that the museum is a glorify organized crime. We try and make heroes out of these organized criminals. But, you know, there's pleasantly surprised to see that we present both sides of the story. You know, we are historians here at the Mob Museum, and we want to tell an accurate and engaging history of organized crime and law enforcement. And I know we haven't seen it too many in detail, but there's a wonderful array of 
artifacts uh, throughout the museum, some of them that you mentioned, especially related to St. Valentine's Day Massacre? Oh, yeah. You know, we're a museum. We exist for our artifacts. You know, we hold those in a public trust. We want to put those in front of our guests so they can learn about mob history through seeing those objects, seeing those pieces of history firsthand. Terrific. What are some of your current, the museum's current uh, plans and programs, events coming up, Ethan? Yeah, so we're always putting on public programs. Uh, you know, people can come to the museum personally to see them. And like I mentioned, they can go on our YouTube page and see them that way too. So, you know, every month we're holding public programs. Uh, in, uh, in November, we are having Kefauver Day. So that's the anniversary of the Kefauver hearing in our courtroom. And, you know, we like to take care of our community. So that's where we are able to make the museum accessible. Uh, it's free for all Nevadans. And even if you're not a Nevada resident, you still get a buy one, get one free deal. Mm. So, you know, either free or through the BOGO, you get to experience the museum in an accessible way. Um, and then last, another thing I want to mention is uh, we, this year we put out our uh, podcast called Inside the Life. Uh -huh. So Inside the Life is uh, hosted by two former undercover agents, Dutch and Giovanni, and they have, uh, they host uh, many people from all sides of organized crime, whether it's law enforcement, reformed mobsters, or even actors and actresses who have played mob roles on TV. Oh, that's and TV fabulous. Oh, continuing to expand. I know there's a wonderful app that you have that you could use there. I know I accessed it here to learn more about how things are organized. So just keep growing and more opportunities for enrichment uh, through the museum. So wonderful to hear. Um, for those watching, how would you recommend they find out more, perhaps even get in touch? Yeah, so for more information, you can go to themobmuseum.org there you can buy tickets if you're planning a trip to Las Vegas. But, you know, even if you're not going to be in Las Vegas, you can still experience our museum through our website. You know, like I said, we have our programming there. We also have a very active blog and a lot of other information about mobsters on our page. So there's a lot you can learn just from visiting our website. And you can also uh, see us on social media. We're also active on Facebook and Instagram X and check out our YouTube channel, too. And then to check out our podcast, go to insidethelife.org. I highly recommend it. Fabulous, fabulous. Well, Zach, unfortunately, we've come to the end of the program. I want to thank you again for taking the time to be here, providing a wonderful overview of all the museum has to offer, both in and out of the museum itself, and wish you and your colleagues continued success with future endeavors. It was my pleasure. Thank you for having me on. Also want to thank those of you watching for joining us and hope you'll be able to tune in next time.